Very special thanks to Affordable Prestige Cars for providing the classic Mark II Jag in this particular video, and of course, those of you who follow the Beards and Cars series will recognise their name, especially when it comes to Jag. So if you do live in the UK, especially in the Southwest, but maybe even a bit further afield, and you want to check out a Jag, maybe even something a bit more specialised like this one, then of course, click the link right below the video in the description to check out their current stock. As with any episode of Beards and Cars revolving around a classic or vintage car, of course I cannot discuss this vehicle in the same way that I would a modern car. It's not like there are people out there thinking, hmm, shall I get a Mazda 6, a Renault Megane, or maybe a Mark II Jag? It's not that kind of video, you know? It's more of a time capsule, as I did when I spoke about the 73 Cortina, the classic Rolls, the classic Jag XJS as well. It's more of a look down memory lane, and crucially, especially for those, myself included, who may skew on a little bit of the younger side, who maybe haven't driven as many classics, maybe still love them, or at least the idea of them, but are curious how a car like this would feel today. Back in the day, of course, things were different. This was the standard. Cars like it were just what you had to work with, just like vehicles today are compared to what they will be 20, 30, 50, 60 years from now. This car, for example, it's over 60 years old, and it had one owner from brand new in that time, so clearly that person loved it. What about now, though? And also, when it comes to qualifications of talking about classics, where do I fall in this discussion? Well, I do skew younger, I'm 28 myself, but I do love classics and vintage, I always have, and I own one myself. I have a 1968 Lincoln from the States. So one of the curious things for me going into driving this was how does it compare to other classics, including my own, that I've driven? Well, first of all, let's talk briefly about the Mark II's history. And I'm by no means an aficionado here when it comes to classic Jags. I'm a fan of their newer stuff, and I've talked about tons of them on the channel. But if I do misspeak about any of this, or just miss some crucial bit of information, then I have no doubt there will be aficionados, younger and older, who might have extra info to share. So by all means, drop that down in the comments. For now, though, the Mark II ran from 1959 to 1967. And kind of midway through that period, there was a couple of other models, or there were a couple of other models even, running alongside it. There was the Daimler version, which looked almost identical, and also the S-Type. But not the S-Type that you're thinking of. This is a classic S-Type. These were available with 2.4 litre, 3.4 litre, and probably most famously 3.8 litre straight six engines. And the one that I'm driving here is a 3.4 with the automatic gearbox. And as you'd expect, they came with either auto or manuals. Now for me, I'm definitely glad that this is an automatic version because even though I do review my fair share of manuals, when it comes to driving a classic, I find that you have to concentrate so much on driving a car like this properly, whether it's a luxury car or even something lower down the market like the Cortina that I mentioned, you really do have to focus, because everything else is moving so much faster around you now, whereas back then everything felt like, you know, life was slower. And it's crazy to say that as somebody who didn't even live through it, but even I can tell. When I jump in my own classic, 55 miles an hour in my Lincoln feels like more than enough. If I get in the Maserati or the Golf or whatever and jump on the motorway and do 55, I'll have some Eddie Stobart lorry up my backside wondering why I'm crawling along. It's weird how the pace of life changes so much, even just between one car and another doing the exact same speed. Now, one thing that I immediately noticed about this car is it's no way near as heavy as you'd expect. In fact, they weigh about 1,500, or in some cases even less, kilos, which is roughly 3,500 pounds. That's really not heavy for a luxury car. And even though technically this isn't the biggest Jag you could buy, that was, if memory serves, the Mark 10 or the Mark X, as it's written in Roman numerals, this was kind of the Jag in terms of fame. Very popular for criminals, very popular for police pursuits here in the UK, especially on motorways, and it's not hard to see why. Alongside some of the big engine triumphs of the time, it's kind of a legendary car when it comes to its performance. Which, again, in hindsight, is quite comical when you actually consider how quick this is by today's standards. Now, with this one, the 3.4 litre, with the auto gearbox, it was actually tested way back in 1961 by a magazine called The Motor. 
they found that this could top out at 120 blistering miles an hour. That's about 193 kilometers an hour. And it could hit 60 miles an hour, or roughly motorway speed, in 12 seconds. What a beast. <laughs> but I tell you what, jokes aside, I have mad respect for anyone who drives this thing at 60 or 70 miles an hour, because I never got this thing up above maybe 50, 55 while I was driving it, and that felt more than fast enough, believe me. You would expect something like maybe a Mini Marcos, which is a personal favourite of mine, maybe a little Triumph Spitfire. Those are the kind of cars you go into driving, or even imagine driving, and think, man, doing 50 miles an hour must feel crazy in something like that. Even in modern terms, in January of this year, I reviewed the modern Fiat Panda 100 HP. Doing 40 miles an hour in that thing feels like 80, and it's so much fun. In an older car, you'd expect that to be even more so, but not so much, or at least for me, not so much, in a bigger car. In, again, my Lincoln, the speed doesn't feel crazy because it's such a big vehicle. In this, it actually has that small car feel of being way more visceral than the speed you're actually doing. And in terms of crosswinds and reacting to bumps in the road, you can definitely feel the car's age, being in particular here a 1960 shape model, and a fantastic condition one, all being said. I mean, look at the bodywork on this thing, and even the interior, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a borderline museum piece, in fact. Now, in terms of power, the three different engines came with, of course, three different power levels. Uh, the base model was, if I recall correctly, around like 120 or so horsepower, then that jumped to about 210, and then about 220, and that top of the tree 3.8 with the 220 horsepower motor actually had quite a bit of success in racing as well. Australian touring cars, European touring cars, some endurance racing stuff as well. So it really is a car that I would argue is justified actually in having that reputation. It's not just a car which got a name because it looked good. It actually could back it up. And I will say as a uh, unnerving as a classic can sometimes be and I said as much in my review even of the Rolls-Royce and that was a 1990 shaped car the way that the steering the brakes are much more vague you kind of politely send a sealed envelope to the brake pedal indicating your soon inclination to slowing down sometime in the near future and then the car considers your request sends it to management and finally when they've made their decision the car begins to slow down that's the case in any kind of classic, and it's definitely the case here because nothing happens on a dime. <laughs> Acceleration, braking, handling, it's all delayed, and you really do have to plan for other people not being good drivers. Because I tell you what, you would not want to be caught out. With that being said, you can definitely feel the sporty side of this car. It definitely doesn't feel underpowered, and in terms of get up and go, if you just put your foot down a little bit more, it can get going. Now, again, with a 12 second 0 to 60 time, it's not like it's going to rip your face off. But for a car from 1960, again, 62 years old at the time of releasing this video, it gets going pretty well. And overall, I would say that the experience of driving any classic, and of course this is something I've talked about before and I will again, there is an undeniable charm. There is a level of personality and charisma and just this immediate feeling of a story that this car has had. And it's kind of crazy to think that this vehicle has been around for six decades. Think of all the changes in culture, in history, in government, in policies, in politics, in world situation that this car has lived through. Changing owners under normal circumstances, not so much with this one, having one owner. And then now I come along, get in the car, and now I'm a part of its story. Something which I've mentioned to a few people now is that I honestly do not feel that modern cars have stories anymore. Cars have become a thing. They're a commodity now. And maybe that was the case back then, but I get the impression that cars used to be a big deal. And the bigger the car, in terms of, you know, badge panache and recognition, Bentley, Rolls, Jag, they were so far ahead of anything else, whereas nowadays a Rolls-Royce really isn't anywhere near up the ladder compared to everything else as it used to be. It used to be Rolls-Royce and then everything else. Now you've got Rolls, you've got Bugatti, you've got Maybach, there's so many alternatives, 
And there are so many cars that are genuinely good, whereas back then there were so many bad cars that the good ones really stood the test of time. And say what you will about Jag's reliability on certain models, Jaguar is pretty hard pressed among British brands to not be the best in terms of consistently making iconic cars. From this, to the E-Type, to the XJS, even right up until now with stuff like the more modern XJ and the XK. They've had such a fantastic history of doing stuff like this, and it is really cool to me to jump into something that feels like it has that kind of history, even though I don't think I would buy one, because as is evident from my choice of a Lincoln Continental, I'm more of a big American kind of classic guy, but I will say there is that undeniable charm. And if you are going to buy a British classic, I mean, unless you want to go for the more stereotypical Bentley or Rolls, well, this is pretty much it. It's either this or the equivalent Rover, and the Rovers just don't quite have the same kind of recognition, same kind of panache. They might be just as quick in some cases, but they've got a bit more of the rough and tumble kind of look to it, a bit more rough and ready, street level. Whereas this, it's a bit more distinguished, a bit more of a gentleman's car, but at the same time, you know, being used in Inspector Morse, the TV series, that one was sold for like a hundred grand after the show ended. It's a car that has this history to it, and it does, as I alluded to, actually live up to it in person as well when you get the chance to drive it. Incidentally, in terms of practicality, as you can kind of tell from the video, even with a taller driver like myself, the space is pretty damn good. I will say that it feels a little bit close to the steering wheel in terms of actual leg room, and the foot area seems to be more so inclined toward having a manual rather than an auto because there's not really anywhere to rest your foot and it certainly feels more like it should have a clutch pedal there but apart from those smaller things it's spacious it's comfortable the seats are pretty nice and i do miss i will say as somebody who easily gets a bad back while driving i do miss how upright the driving position used to be in most cars, whereas nowadays pretty much all cars feel like you're laying down half the time, and I do like that. In my own, in this one, I never drive a car like this and end up with a bad back, so to me that's a win. In terms of space, front and back, both good, boot space is great. In terms of economy even, it's not quite as bad as you might think, and I tell you what, this car drinks a lot less than mine does, mine runs about 7 to the gallon on the carburetta, this one's running about 19 to the gallon, which is about 16 in US miles per gallon, so again for a 62 year old car, not bad, really. Overall, that's it for my thoughts on the Mark II, I think it holds up pretty damn well for what it is, it doesn't compare to a modern car in some of the more obvious ways. But it's definitely one which, if it is a dream of yours, if nothing else, I think it will live up to your hopes in terms of just the charm alone. And of course, with those looks, with that kind of history behind it, and, you know, personal opinions aside, it is a motorsport proven vehicle, so that speaks for itself, one hell of a collector's piece. So overall, that's it for my thoughts on the Mark II. Of course, drop your stories, thoughts, maybe even additional information that you think is cool about the car down below, and of course, to check out the other classic episodes which I mentioned, you can find those here on screen in the Beards and Cars playlist, or right below in the video description as well, and until next time I'll see you then with more. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.